So good evening all. I'm Dr. Guru Sandhya. Today we will be discussing about a very interesting topic, which is TIVA and TCI models. So this may even come as an exam question wherein you will be asked about write about TIVA and what are the uh, TC models or TIVA models which you know about propofol or fentanyl. So this will come in handy in even in your day-to-day -day practice wherein you are going to anesthetize a patient who is going to undergo a, a procedure under neuromonitoring wherein you do not want to use your uh, muscle relaxants or in patients in whom your muscle relaxants are <clears throat> going to develop them in a uh, very negative side. So in those patients, this TIVA is indicated and it comes in handy at very many places. So it is very, very important to know about how these TIVA models work and what are the TCA models which are available in the market. So as to find out uh, which is best for which patient. So what is basically total intravenous anesthesia is, it is the maintenance of gentle anesthesia without the concomitant use of inhaled anesthetics. So may it be nitrous oxide, dust fluorines, fluorines, or whatever fluorines you are using. So TIVA is basically you will maintain the depth of anesthesia with only intravenous agents and you will never use the inhaled anesthetic agents. So you can either use a single drug or combination of a drug to achieve this therapeutic level of the depth of anesthesia. So as I've told earlier, there are a few indications, definitive indications wherein you will use TIVA as an alternative model for using an inhalation anesthetic agent. So those indications are malignant hypothermia risk patients. So in whom there was previous incidence of malignant hypothermia and they have recovered or familial history of malignant hypothermia in who, whom there is long QT syndrome where usage of locals or inhaled anesthetics can precipitate uh, arrhythmias and where there is a history of severe postoperative nausea vomiting especially with the use of inhaled anesthetic agents and nitrous oxide and when you need a tubeless ENT surgery and thoracic surgery and when the patient is having an anticipated difficult intubation bar extubation where you need to titrate that like the contact sensitivity half type or the moment you stop the drug the patient should wake up so when there is difficulty anticipated difficulty in both intubation as well as extubation and in neurosurgery where you uh, where you try to limit the intracranial volumes and very notoriously, we use it for patients who are requiring neurophysiological monitoring because you do not use your uh, neuro, neuromuscular blocking agents and uh, your desflurane or sevoflurane might interfere with the neurophysiological monitoring. And patients in whom there is neuromuscular disorders and myasthenia gravis so as to avoid the neuromuscular blocking agents and in non-operating room anesthesia and when they are using it for daycare where you want to avoid the muscle relaxant and uh, such things. So when the patient itself has a choice of going for TIVA. And the considerations which you would give for TIVA is when the what are the major concerns are what is the drug doing to the body and what is the body doing to the drug and what is the effect you achieve. So these three interplays a very important role in any drug metabolism and the action to perform. So pharmacodynamics you have to see, pharmacokinetics you have to see that will give the effect. So what is the kinetics which you are seeing in a TIVA or TCA model is you need a therapeutic drug concentration level to achieve a desired effect. What is the desired effect? The depth of anesthesia. And you also need to be very sure that you are avoiding any dose related side effects for that particular agent. Suppose you say you are using propofol. So you need to, if you give propofol in larger doses like 200 milligrams or 300 milligrams to get a desired effect. So you will always have the dose related side effect as hypotension and bradycardia. So you need to titrate to the effect, but the effect should have a very less dose related side effect, which is given for the particular drug. And you should always have a rapid onset and rapid offset and a smooth recovery. So will single dose constitute all the mention, all the points which I mentioned about the pharmacokinetics earlier? No, you cannot achieve a, a therapeutic concentration which is lasting for a longer time till the end of surgery with the single bolus. So can we achieve a smooth induction and smooth recovery with the single bolus? To, to achieve it, you need a very much larger dose to attain a steady state concentration above the therapeutic level throughout the surgery. So such larger doses will always be associated with side effects. And also whatever drug you are giving initially will always get eliminated depending upon the kinetics which it follows, may be zero order first order. 
so constant amount of drug will constant amount or constant proportion of the drug will get eliminated so it is very very difficult to achieve a steady state concentration throughout the surgery with a single bolus so what happens when you do a intermittent bolus type so what can you do when you have an intermittent bolus so as you can see suppose if you are giving an intermittent bolus this is time in seconds and this is propofol intermittent boluses as you can see when you give intermittent bolus the when you give the bolus it will spike when you give the bolus the concentration will spike again the concentration will spike but it is not reaching at steady state concentration at all so with an intermittent bolus it is very difficult to achieve a steady state concentration there will be spikes of concentration that overshoots the therapeutic range and that may cause a hemodynamic instability so in order to achieve a complete therapeutic concentration you need a bolus followed by a continuous infusion that is the basic pharmacokinetic pharmacokinetic property behind any tca models but then can we not use a continuous infusion alone why do we need a bolus so you need a bolus because if you use say continuous infusion say 50 to uh, 150 micrograms per kg per minute is the dose of propofol for sedation if you only start with 50 mics to run at a constant rate the infusion will take a very much longer time to achieve the therapeutic plasma concentration rather than leave alone the steady state concentration so only when you give a bolus the bolus dose will reach a therapeutic plasma concentration and when you start the infusion the steady state plasma concentration will be reached so the pharmacokinetic model follows that after the initial bolus of the drug there will be exponential decline in the drug concentration in three phases so as you can see this is the uh, volume of distribution curve so whenever you give the drug the concentration will fall from 100 to the therapeutic plasma concentration level will slightly fall and it will reach a nadir so there is three components which you are uh, main components in which the uh, drug deposits to one is the central component wherein the drug equilibrates very rapidly and one is the muscular component or highly equilibrating component and third is the fat component in which there will be a nadir so the three compartment model is the one which is notoriously used in all of the models of pharmacokinetic models in the tca model so when you give a bolus of a drug or an infusion of a drug the first compartment to reach is the central compartment which is the blood and the first pass pulmonary uptake so this is the v1 compartment and v2 compartment there are two peripheral compartments v2 and v3 so v2 compartment is a rapidly equilibrating compartment which consists of the splanchanic system and the muscle tissues and slowly equilibrating compartment is the fat stores so we will have inter compartment rate constant as in what is the drug that is coming from the compartment central compartment to the rapidly equilibrating compartment will have a constant of k12 what is getting replaced from the rapidly equilibrating compartment to the central compartment will have a constant of k21 it is similar to the same that is what is coming from central compartment to the third compartment will have k13 and k31 for the drug which is getting um, eliminated from the uh, third compartment to the first compartment this k10 this is an elimination constant this is very very important constant which you have to keep in mind this is the eliminating rate constant that will encompass the process of bio transformation or elimination that will irreversibly remove the drug from the central compartment so this k10 forms the basis of all the tca models and this has its wide implication in the tca models so the three compartment model is a very very important thing to note with so what is the pitfall of this three compartment model or all the pharmacokinetic model which you are using right now is it assumes that the bolus is given into the central compartment and the peak concentration is reached at the time zero but the peak concentration of the plasma is not reached at time zero as you can see so the peak plasma concentration will decline from top to bottom but it assumes that the peak concentration is reached at time zero which is never true you give the drug the peak concentration in actuality will be achieved only to 30 to 45 seconds later so there are few um, pharmacokinetic models which i uh, equate for this lag but that is beyond the scope of this lecture and hence i'm not touching it so the pitfall is it assumes that the peak concentration reaches at the time zero 
So that is about the pharmacokinetics, which is involved. Only the three compartment model is an important one to note with.